Michael Maria Pantilla, born Jucka Torsten Lindholm, on July 1965, is a Finnish serial killer. According to Finnish crime magazine Alibi, he is the only Finn that fits FBI's description of a serial killer. Michael Maria, who identifies as a woman now, killed four people, and some would be inclined to say that the judicial system in Finland is in part responsible, being too lenient and failing its citizens time and time again. In November 1981, a 16-years-old Pantilla was on his way onto a friend's home party in the center of the city Ulu. In the lower part of the apartment building, he meets an unknown girl. He stops her from exiting the elevator, forces her back, and presses the button towards the basement floor. He wants the girl to spend the evening with him, but she says no, and that angers him. On the basement floor, the lights go out. He forces her to the ground, strangles her with a scarf, and threatens to rape her. Fortunately, the girl fights back and gets to put her fingers between the scarf and her neck. It will take several minutes of struggle until she manages to escape. It was Jukka Torsten Lindholm's first attempt to a violent crime. The difficulties of Pantilla began during the upper secondary school. He was bullied at school because of his way of being and the way he was presenting himself, often wearing clothes such as a pair of white boots and a red satin jacket. He was always attracted to women's accessories and many times would wear his mother's and sister's clothes, such as tight black leather clothing, scarves and tight down to hand gloves, probably dreaming and wishing of being a woman. Michael's favorite in his teenage years were always his sister's riding boots. It is not clear if this was already gender dysphoria, or if it started as a sexual fetish, or maybe a mix of the two. With a lot of bullying going on, Michael left school at 15. He would later complete his studies as an adult in prison. After dropping high school, Michael didn't have many friends. But the few he had were leading him on a wrong path. Or maybe he was leading them. They were taking drugs and spent weeks on a row being intoxicated. When not taking drugs, they were drinking heavily. This was the time when Michael accumulated in his criminal record the first petty thefts. The guys in their group were all somehow different or special. In that group, Michael was not bully and no one paid attention to the fact that he dressed in leather outfits or that he sometimes wore makeup. It was his own business and he felt accepted. But before dropping from high school, he was hospitalized in a child psychiatry unit. The doctors conducted several examinations on him. Even decades after the crimes, he wouldn't accept the doctor's suggestion that he might suffer from a mental illness. In 2009 he started a hunger strike in prison, but it ended the very next day when the doctor apologized. Michael killed his mother, a 48-year-old barmaid in their apartment in Ulu on 26 August 1985. Both Lindholm and her mother's male friend were suspected of the murder, but it went unsolved until Michael later confessed. The next murder Lindholm committed was on 26 July 1986. He met two 12-year-old girls downtown and persuaded them to come to his apartment so he could lend them some money for alcohol. Within his residence in Ulu, he locked one of the girls in the bathroom. The other girl, Mariana Kutnimi, was knocked down on the floor and was choked to death. After some time, Michael released the other girl from the bathroom and sexually assaulted her. But the girl escaped his grasp and ran from the apartment to the stairway, while Lindholm fled to the nearby forest, where the police soon caught him. He was in an advanced state of drunkenness. In connection with the murder of Kutanimi, Lindholm confessed to the police that he was mistreated by his mother. According to his statement, he had worn the blue leather gloves and the red-colored scarf of his mother before doing the crime. He was angered by the fact that his mother had not been able to release him from the youth mental health facility, and that she had been dating a new man, preferring to live with him, rather than his father. Of course his mother could not defend herself, as Michael already killed her the previous year, and was still hoping he will not be held responsible for the murder. Later, in the Ulu court, he recanted his confession, and claimed he had been using multiple psychoactive drugs at once. 
Michael says about himself, I started wearing earrings and a lot of leather clothes at 14 to 15. Cytomasochistic sex came into my life in the early 1990s, with one stripper that I used to hang out with a lot. It taught me about those things. It is in my character. Sadistic and masochistic sex is not just about tying and flogging, it can be strangling and choking. Controlling breathing has been one of my interests too. The Ulu District Court issued its sentence on 17 March 1987. The court ruled that Lindholm had been guilty of two charges of manslaughter, as well as other crimes, condemning him to nine years and seven months imprisonment. However, later, the court decided that his mother's death was not intentional and was ruled instead an assault or negligent homicide and reduced his sentence to seven years' imprisonment. Lindholm was granted parole in May of 1992. On 31 May 1993, he choked a 42-year-old woman with a cloth belt in her Kempel apartment. Lindholm at first objected sharply to the act, claiming that somebody had set him up. On 23 June 1993, he escaped from the Ulu County Police Station with a man that helped him. The Ulu District Court considered Lindholm to be completely sane and sentenced him again to nine years and a half years imprisonment on 13 December 1993. Following the judgment of the District Court, Lindholm contacted the investigators. He admitted to having killed the woman, but it was an accident. According to him, he had proposed explicit sex and explained that he was playing around her neck before realizing that the woman had died due to choking. Lindholm had wandered off to his mother's grave after the murder, staying there for a few hours. The court subsequently changed the sentence to ten and a half years, sending Lindholm to a special institution. According to psychiatric reports, Lindholm admired the primordial, violent manhood of his teenage years, whatever that means, despite starting to wear dresses and women's underwear while in prison. The head of the institution where he was held forbade this, and Lindholm subsequently complained to a parliament's representative about this. Michael was released on parole in November 2008 again. Before his release, he was subjected to treatment, which concluded that he was not yet ready for civilian life or reintegration, but they still went ahead with it. In prison, he married a woman named Hanel Penthom, who was sentenced to life imprisonment for her husband's murder. They were married for a couple of years. Since then, he renamed himself to Michael Maria Penthom. After one year of being free, he invited a woman to his house in May of 2009. There he tried to choke the woman with both his hands from behind. He was working at that time as a telemarketer, but soon found himself on having huge fights with his boss, and he claims that he started drinking again as a method to cope with the stress. In August 2009, Penthom bought an apartment in a district of the Ulu city. He began to choke a woman who was called for a massage, and was assembling a massage table in the apartment's living room. He denied his guilt. He also denied being guilty of charges of aggravated rape, arguing that if he was guilty, and was indeed naked with the victim, the victim should have noticed a distinguishing sign on his body. His lawyer asked what that meant. He pulled his shirt off. His entire back was covered by a blue ink eagle tattoo. It was so large and striking that it could not be overlooked. In court, his attorney asked the victim if she had noticed a special distinguishing feature in Michael's body. The woman began to cry and said that a terrible bird was on his back. Years later, the attorney looked at the serial killer film Red Dragon, a film in which the main character reveals to the victim his huge back tattoo. He said that scene made him remember vividly the feeling he had in the Helsinki prison in the meeting with Michael. On 11 June 2010, the Ulu District Court sentenced Michael to six years' imprisonment for three attempted manslaughters and numerous assaults. Authorities ordered him to sit through his whole sentence, because according to a mental study, he was regarded as a very dangerous offender. In April 2011, the court considered Michael to have committed only three aggravated assaults, 
lowering the sentence to four years and five months. On 2 March 2012, the Ulu District Court condemned Michael for four years and four months for serious rape, gross ill treatment and false imprisonment. The cruel rape and false imprisonment had taken place on 21 to 22 August 2009 at a hotel in Ulu. The authorities ordered him to execute his full sentence in jail. On Tuesday, 13 October 2015, the now renamed Michael Pantilla escaped from the open prison during a prisoner shopping trip, but was caught the following day. He was granted parole in the spring of 2016. Pantilla's jail sentence was prolonged due to the absences, and the entire term of his sentence was changed to imprisonment in a closed prison. Pantilla was released in 2016 on Christmas and moved to Helsinki. It was supposed to be a new beginning of a crime-free life. He found that living in the capital safe and peaceful. No one was staring or screaming at him. I came here with high expectations. I started looking for honest work, and the support person of the Criminal Maintenance Foundation was a great support person. Then there was a bit of bad luck. The police believed that Pintilla was planning to strangle a teenage girl living next door because Pintilla had written a letter of admiration for the girl. According to Pintilla, this was a misunderstanding. However, the court sentenced him to prison for the letter. I still call it a fake thing. I'm still angry about it. I'm not guilty of anything. In April 2017, the police ordered for Pintilla to be arrested again for alleged aggravated crime and the preparation of a criminal offense, but the Helsinki District Court released him during the investigation. In May 2017, the Helsinki Appellate Court annulled the decision and Pintilla was rearrested. On 7 July 2017, the Helsinki District Court dismissed the prosecution of an aggravated criminal offense or a health offense and ordered Pantilla to be released. In May 2018, the appellate court changed the decision and Pantilla was sentenced to two years and six months imprisonment and to pay the victim compensation of 4,000 euros. On 13 April 2018, Pantilla killed a sex worker in a Helsinki apartment. It took only a month for him to commit a homicide. Again. He stayed at the apartment with the body a couple of days after the act. The victim was found on 4 of May, and Pantilla was arrested two days later in Helsinki, suspected of murder. In the hallway of the apartment, the woman realized who Pantilla was and began to shout at him serial strangler and freak. Pantilla reportedly lost his nerve completely. According to Pantilla, the struggle did not last long. The woman tried to shake off his grip, but soon the woman's lost consciousness and she sank to the floor. Then I took tights, wrapped around the neck and pulled tight. I was confused by rage. I grabbed it by the throat and started to strangle it. Pantilla says that after the homicide, he went in lock mode, which is why he was still in the victim's apartment for more than two days. He said he was afraid of people's reactions. I thought about those 25 years since the last homicide, and again it turned out like this. I did not dare to call for help. I just stayed inside. On 17 May 2018, the police announced that Pantilla had admitted during interrogations that he had committed a homicide. According to the prosecutor, Pantilla strangled the woman with his hands, belt, tights, and a cord. The diversity of the methods indicates that it was not a sudden act. The existence of a strangulation cord was not known in public before the court hearing. In July, the Helsinki District Court sentenced him to life imprisonment for murder. Pantilla later announced that he would appeal the court's decision. The court upheld the sentence, except that it did not consider the offense premeditated. According to experts, problems in relationships, employment, substance use and personality combined with a lack of self-awareness and poor stress tolerance, have caused high-risk violent behavior. 
studies have also shown that Pantilla has had difficulty understanding the seriousness of his actions. When investigated for his third murder, Pantilla had stated to his lawyer that three bodies are not a big deal because he knows men that have four or five killings. According to his lawyer, Pantilla himself was afraid of his anger and the form in which it could sometimes manifest. His attorney thinks that Pantilla is a seriously ill person who would have needed thorough research and treatment. He also says that Michael had many plans and dreams of working and having success, but those plans are largely unrealistic. He criticized the practice of keeping a serial strangler in prison for years without any real help efforts. Long prison sentences did not change the man. I have been assisting Pantilla for almost 30 years, and I have never noticed any enthusiasm to find out what things had led Pantilla to the situation he was in. Pantilla says that, contrary to what the prosecutor claims, he has been able to keep his tendencies in check for long periods of time. When Pantilla was convicted in 1993 of strangling a woman he met in a bar, Pantilla converted to Roman Catholic faith. I was in the faith for 10 years. I did not watch any of these junk magazines during that time, says Pantilla, referring to porn. He says he is in love with Italy and Italian culture and wants someday to live there. He is currently imprisoned. For the moment, 